What's going on, everybody? Uh, this is the Shakedown episode three. My name is Justin Allen. I got my uncle across the table here. This is Walter Allen. And tonight our guest is Sean Butler with Long Spur Tracking. Uh, we came out to his house this evening. He welcomed us here, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about some tracking. I appreciate it, guys, and thanks for coming over on this snowy evening. Yeah, it uh, snowed a good bit, but the roads weren't too bad, so that's that's that made it nice. The uh, You're about two hours from us over here in Buchanan. Yeah, right right here in the old central part of the state, catching all the snow tonight. Yeah, yeah. A little steeper country over here versus... Uh, versus it is a lot right. steeper. Yeah. We're kind of flatlanders compared to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, we, we always talk about there's um, some parts in Ohio, like out towards like Sardis and stuff, and it's just, uh, there's a lot of public land out there that we do some tracking on, and it's just straight up and down. A lot of rock, a lot of cliffs. So... How long have you been tracking with dogs? Well, I th- I think we uh, kind of discussed this earlier, you know, that legally part is four years. Yeah. Um, growing up here in West Virginia, most of the time you you did what you thought was right. Correct. Man, yeah. not always been legal. We always had dogs that find deer. Right. Um, so about 30 years uh, and... Always noticed, uh, had good bird bird dogs, mm-hmm. English setters, Springer Spaniels that were really, they'd go out and find a deer. Right. Uh, did we know what we were doing all the time? <laughs> yeah. No, not at that point until I became a student of it. Yeah. And uh, that was about 12 years ago. And mm-hmm. I started studying the art of it. Well, it's, it's it's interesting. Years ago when I was young, I had a, I had a boxer. Mm-hmm. And we, I had, I grew up on... 13 and a half acres and I, I kid you not I could shoot a deer and go to the house and by the time I would get back out and get the four wheeler she would be there she would, she would be there she would find it every single time man this is that's amazing little boxer yeah yeah so what kind of dog did you start with my first dog that we tracked deer with was a walker mix hound pretty good sized dog yes pretty good sized dog and then my next dog was a springer Spaniel. I really got into bird dogs. Um, that was my passion when I was younger. Bird hunting. Yes. Chasing grouse. There were rough grouse all over this country. And uh, and, and then I got into getting uh, into English setters. And I had a couple of those that were just nose down trackers. And that always amazed me that they, they you know, point a bird here and then go track a deer there. Yeah. And multi dad. Yeah, multi use. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and that kind of led me to where I am today with the 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 Yog Terriers, which are versatile, uh, the short hairs and the wire hairs. And yeah, I only hear one. Yeah, we we can hear a little bit in the background there. Yeah. So, how many dogs do you have right now? We have sixteen. Sixteen. I have sixteen. Now they're not all trackers. Right. Uh, we have four that are really dedicated to tracking. Uh, um, and uh, but we. We use them all. I mean, they're just not all. Right. You know, they're not just house pets. No. We yeah. use them for bird hunting, shed hunting, uh, duck and goose retrieval, mm-hmm. uh, tracking, uh, rabbit hunting. I mean, tree. Is there one in particular you use the most? Uh, my one wire hair, Truda, I use her pretty heavy for hunting. Uh-huh. And then my... Uh, main tracking terrier is jesse and uh, she's uh she's good and how big would you say she is uh she's about 24 pounds and how old is she uh she's four years old four years old yes how many tracks do you think you've had her on oh she has been on a, probably a, I'd, I'd have to look to make sure but a couple hundred couple hundred yeah she she got she's up to 102 recoveries but she took most of this season off because she had a litter of pups so we didn't get her out until late in the season so uh, she's got her 100 recoveries in about three full tracking seasons nice which was uh pretty good and you know she's she's been a good dog uh she she's what we built this business on right and started our line on so how old did you say she was? She is four years old. And she's a jag terrier? And she's a jag terrier. So how many jags do you have? I got uh, seven here at the house mm-hmm. that we own, and then I, I also own three or four more that live with other trackers. Uh-huh. Gotcha. Yeah, we got we got one buddy, Corey Arnold, that 
His is a Jack. Welsh Terrier. Oh, his is a Welsh Terrier. I thought it was a Jack for some reason. Yeah. The, uh, what made you just go with the Jags? Well, I had went on a hunting trip in Texas. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were down there turkey hunting as a family. And I was down there and I, they had uh, buffalo. I was like, hmm, I'd like to hunt one of those. And they turned me loose and I shot one. Well, they had a little patterdale that went everywhere with them, tracked everything. As soon as you shoot an animal, they'd throw it out, kind of like African hunting right. and throwing the Jack Russells. Yep. It. And that patterdale, when he got to that buffalo, just, I mean, he jumped right on it. and Or I should say she. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so I came back home, and, and we had been lobbying for uh, tracking here. So we knew we were going to get a dog. I was like, man, I like that Patterdale, small dog. Right. Because uh, I'd done this before. I mean, I know what a big dog will do to you. This world, yeah. trust me. Yes. I know all about that. So I was like, I, I want a dog that I can carry out of the woods. That's no, right. You know? So... I made a couple phone calls, found a real good breeder in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And he said, my dogs are good trackers. But he said, I'm going to warn you of something. He said, down there where you're at, you have a lot of groundhogs. He said, they, you'll be tracking, and the next thing you know, your long lead will be down in the <laughs> Yep. He said, they are more tuned to groundwork. And I said, oh, okay. So I did some more studying, called him back. And I said, well, what would you suggest? And he said, you ever heard of a York Terrier? Well, being a, a West Virginia mountain boy, I was like, a York Terrier? No, I have it. And he said, well, he said, let me just break it down simple for you. A jag dog. I said, yeah, I've heard of those. Yep. Okay. And I said, I seen one at action on a boar hunt down in Tennessee, early 2000s. I was impressed by that. I mean, they just... And go do the job. They're playing of heart. No quit. Exactly. So refocused my search. And uh, he hooked me up with uh, Chris Phillips down at Briarwoods Gun Dogs in North Carolina. Talked to Chris. And Chris said, well, I will not sell a dog to somebody that just tracks. And I said, well, I live up here in the mountains. I can guarantee you she's not just going to track I said, if she'll tree, we're going to run squirrels and whatever will go up a tree. I said, if she wants to go after foxes, I'm, you know, we'll hunt anything and everything. And she'll retrieve birds because he was telling me, you know, their versatility. He uses them for everything. That's right. And he said, okay. He said, send me a deposit. And he told me I'd probably have 12 to 18 months waiting list. Send him a deposit. That was a couple of days before Christmas in 2019. Uh, I think January 1st, he called me and he said, if you want one of my pups out of my line, some available in Tennessee, if you're willing to go get them. So so these are out of your, he said, this is my breeding, just a satellite. Guy bought two of my dogs. He said, and I back him a hundred percent. Said, I'll be down. So we drove down, uh, almost to the Alabama border and, uh, Walked into that kennel with six pups, and one of them just kept grabbing my leg and shaking the heck. That's the one. I said, and uh, Jeff, the breeder, he said, she's she's a troublemaker. I don't know if you want her. I said, I'll take her. She picked you. Uh-huh. Yeah. I said, I'll take her. And uh, came back home, and, and we've been running them ever since. I mean, just, just building the line, learning from different mentors and mm-hmm. and throughout the country and, and uh so, how how do you get your dog started tracking? Like, uh, do you mock track? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, at first, with these, especially Yog Terriers, well, all the pups now, we just, we've come up with our own little system. Mm-hmm. Now, it's similar to what everybody else uses. I mean, we liver drag at first. Mm-hmm. We get them liver dragging, uh, trying to get them out to about, 75 to 100 yards, had a right-hand turn or, or a 90-degree turn, and I should say. Right. And once they start, as soon as they master that, I'll start doing blood drops, get them connecting the dots. Then we'll do the blood drops and putting gaps in it and maybe add 90s. So the last thing I do is start delaying them. Mm-hmm. 
uh, that time delay. I, I think it's more important for them early to figure out. Short tracks with big reward. Yes. And connecting that dot. And then once they start showing me they got that, we'll start adding the time delay. I don't throw interdigital cliff tracking at them until they're about eight months old. And what I like to do is I like to take a pup. Like right now I have a 10-week-old pup that I kept out of this last lit. Get him started now, liver dragging, uh, getting him built up to where this fall, uh, when I take him on his first tracks, then I'll start mock tracking with interdigital. Right, right. Then he'll start connecting the dots. Shifting right over. So how do you do the interdigital? Do you, you do like the hooves in, in those boots? I do not use, I mean, I have tracking shoes. I don't right. use them because you see the terrain around here. Yeah. Those things are like skis. Right. Uh, I ha I use a PVC uh, hoof stick. Mm -hmm. Just make it out of PVC. Uh, I use one hoof. Right. Uh, I have guys say, well, why just one? I'm like, if a dog can track one, it can track, track four. four. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. So you don't worry about your boot tracks mm -hmm. along the side of the muck? I don't. So I've no. never had any no. issue? No. Uh, that was one thing that him and I always talked about because we we've just never done the mock tracks. We just put them on the real the real deal and at about eight or ten months old, always stick them on the live right yeah track. and just put them on as many that you know are dead, you know short short distance whatever. And uh, like him and I were talking about, well, how does how do they not just track you if if you're doing a mock trail? Because obviously you're going to leave sit right. rubber boots or not, they're still going to. This is what I tell people. Because uh, we get that question all the time. And, and bloodhounds and actually bird dogs are bad about tracking you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I True to my one GWP year, kind of similar to your boxer. I can go out here and go hunt, squirrel hunt, and leave her here, come home, let her out. And she's going to go follow everything. Every place you went. Yeah. Every place I went, she goes and makes that circle and comes back. Right. But she's tracking. Mm-hmm. And she's smart enough that when I put her on something... She knows what she's tracking. That's what she's going to track. So I tell her, you know, can I say that they're tracking that mock track 100%? No, we can't. There's no way we can make it scent free. No. There's no way. But they're tracking. That scent's there along with your scent. Mm -hmm. Then you take them out and put them on a deer. And they're like, maybe the first time they might be a little rough. But they'll they'll get it. Right. They'll get it. My biggest concern with the mock scrape has always been uh, most of my tracks are for someone else. Right. And they've all went and looked for their deer. Mm -hmm. They've walked all over. They've spread the scent right. all over the woods. Regardless of what they tell you. Right. <laughs> and I really don't want my dog tracking their boot tracks. Now, several times I can, I've can i noticed my dog hit the boot tracks. She run down them boot tracks thinking it's going straight to the deer. And that's been my biggest concern with the mock tracks. Yeah, that you could be conditioning the dog to, to follow their boot tracks. I mean, that's a possibility. It's something I've not really witnessed. But you haven't had no issue with. I haven't. I haven't had any issue. With. Yeah. I mean, I can see with the way you do it with the with the liver and then the blood. Like you're putting it in their mind that they're tracking a particular scent. Right. And then once they figure out that inner digital, then they they think they've got it. Right. And you take a a prey driven breed, and you put them on a scent that they get filed in their mind. That if I follow this and I get to the end of it, I get I'm, a reward. I'm going to bite something. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. That's what my dog does. The minute he gets there, it's it's all right. It tears him up. Yeah. Exactly. And once that gets in their brain probably after the third or fourth with these terriers third or fourth lot what we call live track mm -hmm. it's over right you've got it they've got it they've got it yes it took me longer to learn than it did my dogs it, yeah and, and that's what i tell people yeah it'll, it'll take you some trackers it takes them their second dog before they ever understand every thing and then how to still, how to how to read the dog yeah that's right and then yeah. you're still learning yeah just, so, so i've had three full-time trackers which each of those have tracked a few hundred deer. Right. So Sonny, my first tracker, was really easy to read. He was real slow. He would go by every, show me every drop of blood. If there was blood on a weed up high, he'd stop and smell it. He'd go to the bed and smell, you know, and I, could, I just look where he smells. I find the blood. So the second one, Bear, 
He's a little more hyper. He was deaf. He was sign language dog. He had a great nose, but he was much harder to read. And then Sonny got sick, so I had to use Bear. For about four years, I used Bear steady. And he was just a little more difficult. They just faster and overrun the track a little bit, right. maybe. But now I have Buck, and Buck is seven, and he's just so much like Sonny. He's so easy to read. Yeah. So I have Buck's son, Grizz, and Grizz's mom was a Parsons Russell Terrier. Well, Buck is a short-legged okay. Jack Russell Terrier, so he's little shorty Jack. Right. That's what they're mostly referred to. But Buck is so much calmer and, and easier. I mean, he'll just take you down that track. He'll just pick it away, show you everything where... Grizz, I mean, he gets you down the track real fast. If you ain't careful, you're overrunning the track. Right. And I'll, I'll end up 100 yards overrunning it before I realize where something's off. Uh-huh. And I'll turn around and go back and we'll start again. So I wondered about the Jags. Are they hard to read like the? I, well, I'll tell you, Jesse, my main tracker, it took me about 40 tracks in with her and I, I started picking up her cues her cues when she's on right when she's not started learning that feel and that lead yep. with her uh the biggest thing they took with me on her was when she was telling me a deer had cut back on its trail yep. and that's one of the most difficult reads on any dog sure but it took me about the third time i was like we need to go this way look for this deer back the way we came and the guy said i appreciate sure it that way. i said trust your dog i said she just she what she does is she just stops and she doesn't turn around and start tracking back she just stops and she stands there and she's looking in all four directions she had no hurry which is unusual for her because she's usually pulling like a sled dog yeah and that stopping is only good for about 10 seconds and then she'll keep going straight and then she wants to go check all the country out. Yeah. Run of her. And then you know she's searching. You can tell she come to the end of that. that yes. Says, yeah. So the next time she did that, I, that's when I said, we need to look behind. I redirected her back. She went right nose down, right back past the bed that we had knew the deer had been in. Yeah. 100 yards back in another hollow there he lay. I was like, okay, now I'm kind of getting. Yeah, love this dog. Each dog's different. So she is readable. Now her daughter Massey and and and, and she was amazing me last year as a seven month old pup. Just running real steady, uh making Jesse make a left, she'd make a right and go make a recovery. She had thirteen on her own there last year. Uh, or I should say the year before, her first tracking season. And was kind of easy to read. This year, she's become a little more bolder, faster. She was overrunning stuff. Overrunning. And I've, I've seen that from year two with a lot of dogs. It's like they get their maturity and they're like... Okay, Confidence build up. Uh, I know where I'm going. Yes. So this year, I had to rein her in. And she's a little harder to read because she wants to... Boy, she just... She's not always nose down. Yep. She's wanting to kind of look ahead, hunt a little bit, head... It's a whole different ball game with her. Totally different read. And we've had uh, a couple of males that that track pretty good, but they they hunt the track more than they track. It seems in the yog terriers, the males are more of a hunter, and the females like put their nose right down and can go with it. Um, now I kept a pup out of this litter, which would be a full sister to the one I kept last year. And he, he's a male, and I'm going to try him out hard. I'm wanting, I'm wanting a big, you know, 29, 30-pound sure. male to, to get this tracking thing down because sometimes it can get hairy out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, Massey, uh, she's only 18 pounds, or Jesse's, you know, 22, 23 pounds, so. Sure. My, my Jack Russells are 20 pounds. Yeah, so, and 15 pounds, you know, and, they're not very big. And they don't back off, I mean. They don't back off at all. So so with the Jacks, it's been the male that's been the better tracker. Really? The females are more independent. I had a female that was a squirrel dog, excellent squirrel dog. If there was two squirrels in the tree, she would tell you, because she had one squirrel, she'd go right back in the tree again. You just watch where she was looking. 
and she did find a couple of deer, but if, if we got on a squirrel track in the middle, middle of the hunt, she was squirrel hunting. Right. And I always joked that everybody told everybody that, uh, the male dogs belonged to me and I belonged to her huh? because I would yell for her and yell for her. And you look down, she's sitting right there looking at you. I mean, she was the hunter. The male dogs would sit back and let her flush and she would find it, flush it. They would go in for the kill. Huh. And my male dogs seemed to be more loyal. They're there to please me, to do what I want to want to do. Right. They're always right at my side, ready to go, where the female was off hunting, more in, or more independent. Right. So I've always had male trackers. That, that, that's interesting, yeah, because with the dogs, I mean, the loyalty factor is the same. The males are, they want to be right here. Yep, that's the one. It, the males, my two males, I could set them in my lap in a deer blind and they'd be fine. Yeah, absolutely. My females, no way. They'd see a deer and it'd be me. What? Yep, yep. The females, more the independent hunter. And when I go hunt. But I, I have better luck with in the Yog Terrier with, with them as tracker. Really? Uh, you know, I I got Jesse first thinking long term of creating our own line eventually. But she turned out to be a good tracker. Then I bought her, the next year I bought her full brother. And... He does well, but he's more of a hunter. He just, he is a very really? loyal dog hunter. He, he'll be down, going down track and all of a sudden, oh, there's a hollow tree. I got to go get Better it. Better go check it out. I got to go get in it. That's the way Grizz is. Yeah. Now, so, Buck is um, steady. And those are the ground, slow, steady. Uh, there'll be other people watching. And, you know, he may stop and look at them if they're talking. Uh, I tell everybody to stay behind us, but if you get in front of us, it leads him on. Right. If somebody walks up here, he'll look up at them, go check them out, and then come back and keep tracking. Right. But he's just slow and steady, methodical. Show me every bed. If the, if it's the right bed, he'll go right to it and smell. If it's the wrong bed, he'll walk right straight through it without slowing down. Right. But he'll take me to almost every bed, every scrape, especially during the rut. He's looking for that tarsal gland smell. Right. So he'll shortcut to it and then come back. But the minute we find the deer, I, I can tell immediately when, when he's found it. Not necessarily when I've seen it or found it. But when he's close enough. But to I know when Buck's it. found it. Right. And it's either going to be jumped or else it's going to be laying right there. He, he, it's, he, can you tell the same with yes. your dogs? And that was a, y yes, I can. And that was a question I was going to ask you, you know, how soon can you tell that? So if it's a high shoulder shot, you know, most of the time I ask the hunter, and it's not always where they think it is, but a lot of times they got a good idea, especially with the bow where it's hit. Sometimes with the high shoulder shot, I can't get him to pay any attention. I mean, he just, you might see good blood, but it's not fatal. It's not a fatal shot. He's and not he, as interested. Him. We're just not getting down the trail. I mean, he's searching, he's peeing on bushes. He's, it's like, I tell them, if it looks like he's asking me which way to go, like I'm walking the dog, it's not good. That's what I tell people also. If they're slacking that lead. If the leash is tight, you follow him. Uh-huh. Uh, of course, the first year uh, doing this and, and and trying to do it right, I, well, I tracked everything. Yeah. 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 I tracked everything. I went for miles. we get permission and... It, I can remember running deer past people sitting in their vans at the intersection waiting for us to come through that property. We just seen it go by and we're chasing it some more, you know, we're chasing it yep. for hours because we didn't know when to quit. And then I, by that second year, I, I, I started noticing it. There's a difference between tracking and chasing. That's right. And anymore, Jesse, you just put her down and... I go to the first hundred feet. Pretty you got a pretty good idea. If, yeah, if she's going to be interested, right? Or not. And you know, about midway through the last tracking season, I started playing my cards. Then, yeah, uh, before I just always held them tight and wouldn't say. But last right. year, I started saying because we've been getting called so much, and I'd, I'd start, okay, we're a hundred yards in, and she's not pulling. I think your deer's up and alive. Well. Man, you came here all this way, and I, hey, if it's alive, it's alive. There's, we're not going to catch it. Right. And I, I think we disappointed a few people that 
leaving them that quick, but then it's something a week later when they call you back and say, oh, I got a trail camp here. Sure. Right. Or, yeah. sure. So then that gets your confidence level. And then the other thing, I mean, within 50 yards, I know if it's dead. With John. Oh, it's straight to it. Yeah, I know if it's dead within 50 yards. I mean, she get she gets lined out at that impact site. And it doesn't matter five or 600 yards away. Right. You're there. I mean, it's yeah. there's no straight to it. Yeah. And, and people that haven't tracked or, or new trackers, yep. they listen to you talk and they're like, yeah, whatever. When you know that dog. Yeah. And I tell you everything. You got to be a dog person. Got to. Uh, got to spend time with them. I mean, yeah. my dog's with me all the time. And that's, I refer back, you know, to mine younger years with the setters i could tell uh they didn't have to point to let me know there were grouse in the area right that was their demeanor change right yep i know when i started with my german shepherd in that first year uh there were several times like i i wouldn't trust the dog i would think all right we he's going the wrong way and i'd spin him around and then he'd spin me back around and we'd go find it right and every time i talked to water you just got trust the dog, trust the dog right. and then you get to a point of where you do just trust the dog, and before too long, he's just dragging dragging you to him. Right. I I tell all my young trackers that come on a board with us their first year, and your job's to trust the dog. Mm-hmm. And I said, I can tell you this, and I can tell you this, but you will learn it the hard way. Yeah. And they all say, what do you mean? I said, every one of you is going to call me. You're going to leave a track, and within an hour... Within an hour, a hunter is going to call you and say, I found my deer. And you're going to look back and you're going to say, dog was taken. Dog wanted to go. That Your direction. dog was going the way. Yeah. The right and I said, it happens to everybody. Absolutely. And I said, the good trackers learn from. Mm-hmm. Trust your dog. I tell everybody, walk the extra mile. My oldest boy tracks with Grizz all the time and he does really good. And he'll call me and he's, I've been walking for 600 yards and I said, Chris still pulling? He said, yeah, he's still pulling good. I said, man, you just got to go a little farther till you know, till you see the deer, till he changes, till you know you've jumped him, and he'll call me back. He's like, we got him, we got him, you know. And over and over, you just have to trust the dog. And, and many times, Buck will want to go somewhere else, and I can see the deer went this way. There may be blood, there may be skid marks. You know, I just know the deer went this way. But there's something over there that's got his attention. And he's going to keep thinking about that until I relieve his mind. Yeah, let him go check. So over and over, I'll just walk over there with him, let him smell it, let him check it out. He'll give up, come back, here we go again. So sometimes I'll get on the track and I'll go so far and I'll I'll come into a, a hard spot. And it's just like I lost the track. And I'll look and look and look. So then I'll circle back and reset. Mm -hmm. And over and over, I'll reset and I'll get going again. Do you have to reset with your dogs? Yes. Uh, I tell most hunters, when you do that first reset, they're looking at you. Starting to get skeptical. But I thought you knew what you were doing here. You know, I said, hey, we found a lot of deer on third reset. Always. Yeah. Uh, Just over and over. And they said, well, why? Why? I said, these are prey-driven dogs. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, most of the time I'm looking at my watch and we're you know, 26, 28 hours out from when you shot this. How many coyotes, how many raccoons? How much has been in here? Yes, I've crossed this track. And said, I said, this dog, she, she'd she rather kill a coyote than find your deer. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so always about that third time, though, it's worked out. Yeah. She understands what I'm, yeah. And, and I do that. Also knowing, though, on that pool that she's already told me that deer is dead. Right. But she gets distracted. And I, I can tell it now. I, like I said, you got to learn how to read that. That's right. You got to know. And time and over gotta, and over and over. More, more tracks. There's reading the dog, uh, reading the topography, and knowing whitetails. Exactly. All Trying, three of those, it takes all three. It takes all three. You got to be able to fill in the blanks. I, I'll look on my, my topo map on my Onyx all the time. I use the Onyx, and I always use the tracker. Mm-hmm. I'll start the tracker usually when I start walking, so I know right. how far I've walked. But I'll put a waypoint where they shot the deer, mm-hmm. and then as I go down the track, I'll put waypoints on blood. As right. I see blood, as I see blood, 
till I get to the last blood. And then over and over, um, Buck might take me right to it, but sometimes he doesn't take me to it. Right. So then I'll get back on here and say, well, there's a road. We're headed towards the road. Right here, the trees come closest to the road. Right here is the trees come closest. I think we, this would be the crossing, mm. natural deer crossing. I think we should look here. And then you get going, there. there go. there's the blood trail. There it is again. There's so you got to help. There are gaps in the track yeah. where you need to help fill it in. And knowing whitetails, knowing how they run, knowing your dog, and also knowing the terrain mm-hmm. really makes a big right. difference. Exactly. I, I think that's one of the things... Uh, that when our, we get our guys going, they start to realize is reading that terrain. Yep. Uh, Helping the dog along. Yes. And then mentally filing these deer because you'll start to remember, tra- okay, this deer did that. Exactly. And deer are creatures of habit. They do. Big bucks like what big bucks like. Oh, that's right. And they will do... Some of the most similar things. Now, one of the things we see here in the mountains, and and I just posted one of these on our page. You know, we had a recovery yesterday morning. One of my guys, uh, probably the last one for this year, West Virginia, because our uh, heritage hunt was this weekend. Got shot uh, right on the white line uh, with a round ball, and the deer went 582 yards in a straight line uphill, unmolested. Boy didn't follow it. He knew he got shot it. But that deer went uphill, and when it got to the first flat, it laid down right on the edge of it and was watching downhill. And it's amazing how many times when we start our dogs on a gut shot and they start going uphill, the hunter says, whoa, 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 the creek's down here. Yes. And, you know, when I first started tracking and and being a deer hunter, that was the old, you know. They go to water. They go to water. Okay, well, some of them do. Gravity pulls them down. Yes. Yeah. A sick, dying deer is never going to drink water again. No. Uh, nine out of ten of them gain elevation, lay down, and watch the back, back trail. And if you don't follow them, they lay down really quick. First first little rise where they can see, that's where they'll be dead at. But a hunter that shoots deer, if, unless there's noticeable blood on the ground, it, that deer goes uphill I, a lot of them will be like, nah, that, I shot that deer so good. It's, there's no way he's going to climb. Yeah, there's no way. There's if no he way. does climb that hill, he's going to live. I'm like, I'm telling you, deer live out here. Like, that hill's nothing to them. Yeah. That's, they, they live here. That's their spot. That's and they, they want to go to survive. I mean, right. That's right. If I go up here and lay down and watch my back trail, I'll see. Get the know. upper hand on you. If mm-hmm. they can't get the wind in their favor, they yeah. want to be able to see what's coming. Exactly. So, I, you know, just knowing deer, and that's something now. I, I get these young guys to see because even some of these trackers you bring on, I mean, they're they're gun ho. They're 25, 28 years old. And they want to do it. Sounds like a good idea. And then they get out there and they say, learn. And yep. they don't know as much about deer as they think they do. And they don't know as much about dogs as they think they do, but they're willing to learn. So if they learn and listen, and they can get it. They can get it. What I've learned along the way is hey, most time I'm tracking for someone I don't even know or past clients I know through tracking and they really want to know that you're doing the right thing that your dog and if you're not finding any blood to show them or or sign you know so they they want some kind of reassurance so if it's a dead deer I average 20 minutes or less right and probably more like 14 minutes right doesn't matter if it's five or six hundred yards it just this, there's so much scent left behind, and it's the proper scent. He takes you straight to it. But now on live deer, I average two hours and two miles. And that's because even though I know the deer is not there, right? I just keep going until they are satisfied yeah. the deer is not there. Because a lot of my calls, you know, I've averaged about 60% recoveries or finds. Not all of my finds are dead deer. If I see a live deer get up and uh, run off, my dog found it. It, right. it. It's not up to me to kill it. But I think they want to know for sure that you've covered the area. So some of my tracks I go on, there's no blood. There's no proof of a hit. There's no arrow. 
but they want the confidence of the dog. If the right. dog walks through there, the deer's not there. Then they're happy. Then they're happy. Yep. Right. And I, I, over and over, I, I do a lot of, I wouldn't say useless tracks, but I do a lot of tracks where I know I'm not going to find them. It's just right. a peace of mind track. It's just a peace of mind. Exactly. Track. Uh, yeah, we call them peace of mind therapy tracks. Now, in the height of the rut, when I'm getting 15, 20 calls a day, I'm doing five calls a day, I try to take the most productive tracks when I can help the most people the best. When I can right. get the most dead deer out of the woods the fastest, I try to line up as many tracks close together as I can yes. instead of driving two hours here, two hours there. Yes. So, but uh, for the most part, you know, I, I'll take any track and right. I'll just go out there just to, just so they know. I, even even outfitters will call me. And if Buck says the deer is not wounded, right. the hunter gets to hunt again. Hunter gets to keep hunting, right. yeah. And if Buck says he's got it, he's wounded, uh, you know, if they draw blood, most of them are paying for that deer. That's their deer. They can hunt as long as they hunt that deer. Right. right. But, uh, right. you know, so a lot of tracks I know we're not going to find, but I still got to take Buck and, and do, look. Yeah. And that's kind of like our policy. Like you say, when, when the deer's dead, it's over quick. It's quick. Yeah. Unless something weird is happening. Yeah, and that... I, it it can't happen. They bump them and, you know... They, yeah. Something. It, you always get that odd story. And yeah, I've had, for the most part, it's it's fast. Yeah, it's fast, quick, right there you are. And, and that was something that I tell all my... Tra- you know, if it's not a, happening for you in the first 30 minutes, give that hunter an hour or two hours. Do a little grid search at the end of your, where your dog's not wanting to work anymore. Show it on. We use Garmin's. Yeah. Show that hunter that grid. Eliminate enough ground that you know it's not laying in a, a normal fatal area. Right. The deer, in order to get that far away, on its own will and under its own power, must be alive. Right. Yeah. At least it's going to be alive for the time that you're there. Right. Now, some of them do die after I leave. Yeah. But yep. there's no telling how long they were alive. Or, you know, there's just no telling what happens after you leave. Right. And some of them I know are going to die. I've left a few that were gut shot, that mm-hmm. were alive when we were there. But we've left them in such a place where... You know they're going to die. Sure they're going to die. Sure if we keep chasing them, we're just going to keep chasing them. So we'll back out, right. come back a day or two later and, and find them. So my uncle and I were talking the other day on the other podcast that we did about how we have like a questionnaire interview and... I thought I seen something from you the other day. You have like a paper, right? We do have a paper. You drew up with all your questions. You fill it out. Yeah. I assume that you do that since you have some of your hunters underneath of you. You can take the interview and then just send them the, the right. paper. Or or any of them can take the interview. Right. And uh, we use Facebook Messenger. We have a chain, uh, 45 guys on there in 10 states. And we can post that paper up on there. Everybody can look at it. Uh, voice their opinion. Voice their opinion. Some of the older guys can say, uh, well, that that's probably a 50-50 track, but, right. you know, if it's 50-50, I tell them go run it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so you do turn some of them down. I do turn some of them down, and, and we've caught some heck from some of these, you know, guys that are think themselves big tractors, which is fine. Oh, you should go run them all. And, like, the amount of phone calls we're getting, I can't. I would like to. I'd like to have enough guys to go run them all. This is not possible. It's not possible. And, I, you know, that's... When they come, they come in, in waves. In waves, yeah. The rut happens yeah. all at one time. All your does are in heat within two weeks, usually. Everything's happening now, and your calls are 10 right. a day or 10 so, tracks a day right now. Right. Two things I had going on. I, I am a biologist, wildlife biologist, so... I have a pretty good read on if a deer's dead or not. That's right. And the second thing is, is I I spent eight years as a military medic, so I'm pretty good at triaging. And if your deer's not dead and I have time, I'll come track it. But if I have nine other guys that have deer that are probably dead, I need to go track Those are the ones you need to That's exactly right. I need to go help those guys because, you know, we want, of course... Number one, everybody says, well, you're just doing trophy recovery. No, no, I, I want to find their deer so they can use their whole deer. Right. That's number one job. Uh, number two is if we can't, we want to recover their trophy and get a tag on that thing so they're not out there shooting another one. That's right. 
Uh, so it's good conservation. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, we help fill a lot of tags that would right. go unfilled. And we make a lot of tax nerves. So a lot of the tracks I won't take, um, you know, they call me, they've been 800 yards. They know it's a high shoulder shot. They may find a little bit of lung blood and then the lung blood dried up. And a lot of these tracks are lots and lots of blood. And they think, because there's so much blood, it yeah. has to be dead. But I tell everybody the amount of blood means nothing. It's all in what's in the blood, That's the right. color of the blood. So some of the tracks I'll turn down because I don't want to take my dog out there and run him on a, a track I'm confident that is a live deer. So if it's a live deer, buck works harder. He works faster, especially if we jump it. And he's more likely to poke his eye out or cause trouble. Well, then that'll take him out. It could take him out forever. He got his eye cut. Once. He did poke one eye out. So I try to limit the amount of tracks to good tracks if I can. For one, if I got him tracking for 15 minutes to a dead deer, I'm out. Right. If I got him two hours tracking, that's a lot of 15 minute dead deer I could have found mm -hmm. in that amount of time. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> so West Virginia was going to two buck limit this year, right? Yes. Right. So I don't know. I, everybody thinks that that's going to make a huge difference. I think it will make a difference, uh, but I don't think it's going to be quick. I don't think it'll be quick. The difference will be up here. It'll be a mental. Yeah. Um, um, it, you know, it's not going to be as effective as a one buck limit. Now, I, I'm for, you know, I'm glad they lowered it. I'm glad. Uh, from a management standpoint, I go out here. I mean, as you drove in, you could see all the huge fields we got here. And and you walk out here and see 20, 30 does and no bucks. Right. It's like, okay, so we got to get this flipped. We need to kill as many does as we're killing bucks it, or more. It kind of seems like as the years get, you know, progress on and people get more serious about it and killing big bucks and implementing the food plots and minerals and everything, they start only hunting bucks. They're not yeah. killing the the doe numbers that we need right. that we need to kill. And you know, West West Virginia's backwards. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, we sell you a license, and we give you a, right now. You know, up, up until this year, here's your three bucks on that license. We don't charge you any extra for those three bucks. But boy, if you want to kill a doe, we need him more money. Right, right. So then you take a guy, myself, uh, my wife hunts and my daughter hunts. Mm -hmm. Say we lived in West Virginia. Each of us got three buck tags. Mm -hmm. Well, if each of us killed one buck a piece, that's three deer in our freezer. We're not likely to go out and kill many does put in our freezer. No. That's right. So that leaves everybody shooting bucks. Right. So when you're taking out, and you're probably going to shoot the biggest bucks that you have on your herd. Right. So if you was raising beef, you would keep your biggest bucks and take out the lesser bucks. Right. We're doing just the opposite with deer. Right. We're keeping our lesser bucks, right. and we're shooting our best ones. Right. The, we're shooting our bucks and letting the does live because I think you ought to earn a buck. So, well, West Virginia did do that. So you, you can kill a buck, but you can't kill your second buck. You have to kill a doe in between them now. I almost right. think we should counties. have to kill a doe yeah, first. It's only in certain counties. Yeah. yeah, we'd like to see that statewide. I mean, uh, yeah. And, yeah, it wouldn't even hurt. Hey, kill the doe first. Kill doe first. Like Michigan. Yes. For every four deer that's turned in, three of them are bucks. Right. And I'll bet West Virginia is almost the same way. Absolutely. You, you take people shooting two deer, two bucks in a year, they're not going to go out there and fill their freezer full of does. No. They're just, and, and then, 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 like you said, it's backwards. It's, the, it's yeah. managing the herd backwards. When we were trying to lower this limit, um, from three to two, you know, the biggest argument you get is uh, from the guys that didn't want it lowered. Well, only 8% of the people kill three bucks. Okay, that's true. Very few people do kill three bucks in West Virginia. But of all the ones that kill two, 67% of them, that's all they killed, two. All those two, yeah. They don't shoot them. Right. Yep. So if they would go to that, earn that second tag. Mm-hmm. It'd yeah. make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Need yeah. to equalize it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can kill a doe, kill a buck, then you got to kill another doe or two does before you can kill another buck. I tell my wife and my daughter, we started this year. If we kill a buck on a piece of property, we have to kill a doe yeah, on that piece of property. Buck. Yeah. Or two. Yeah. 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 I've never been uh, prejudiced against shooting. Yeah. <laughs> sure. 
So kind of going back to that triage thing. Yeah. So do you examine the blood when you're going down the trail? When you get there to track a deer, do you stop and look at the blood, look what's in the blood, try to determine which organs may have been hit? I, yes, I do. Unless that dog's pulling me so hard that I don't have time to look. You're just going. I'm just going. Now, the first uh, first year we tracked, uh, Chrissy tracked with me. And she would come behind me and she'd take pictures. Mark blood. Of course, I'm marking at GPS. She's marking it with flagging. She's talking to Hunter through what's going on uh, in front. You know, it's because sometimes I'm pulling away. Yeah, I'm going fast. So we ended up, with, you know, with a pretty good catalog of pictures. And then I could go back and say, okay, this deer was shot here. Here's these pictures, and and kind of start figuring it out. Now, if I can slow my dog down, especially if I see blood and I have time to kind of slow down say, mm, I see what I'm saying there. See, that's the glory of Buck. He'll just stop and wait. Right. He'll just stop and stay there. And if, if I'm on the right track, he just won't turn around. Right. I can yell for him, hey, Buck, come on, Buck. And he'll just stand there. He might turn around and look at me like, but he won't come back. <laughs> and if he turns around and comes back, we're going the wrong way. So I get a lot of time to look at the blood. And I'm always, always looking at the blood. And I can almost tell... Yeah. Immediately, if there's any organ involved or not. Right. Now, sometimes it's it's um, artery, right. you know, just straight artery blood. But for the most part, when somebody calls me and tells me they made a perfect shot, it's <laughs> not good. I normally don't find those deer. And, and what I tell them, 98% of the time, if a deer is shot in front of the diaphragm, you call me, you tell me you made a perfect shot, you can't find it. I can't find it dead. Right. Now, I do find most of them. I do find 60, 70%. Right. But uh, most of those are alive when I find them. I find the occasional deer buried up under a brush pile they just missed. It was it was there. They just didn't see right. it. But for the most part, if it's shot in front of the diaphragm, the heart-lung cavity, you got the heart, the lungs, the main arteries. That's the only three things up front going to kill it. Right. Those are happen fast. Right. And if, if you can't find it dead, I can't find it dead either. Uh, yeah, that's... Most hunters think if they draw blood, they have a dead deer. That's right. It's bleeding. Yeah. There's blood everywhere. It's yeah. got to be dead. Right. And when they start... Uh, we, we came out with our app this year. It had a 3D model on it. What? And, and the hunters would get to look at that and... I, I'd actually use that if the even if the hunter didn't go through the app. I'd say, well, now where did you hit the steer at? And they'd tell me on a on our paper chart, and I'd transfer that over and send it back, peeled back to where the where their trajectory went through, and say, now what vital did you hit? That's what I always tell them. What is killing this deer? Yeah, and they'd look at it and they'd say, ooh. I said, now, you know. I have time. I'll come track it. But I'm going to tell you, it's a therapy session, I right. do believe. That's right. So tell us a little bit more about the app. What's it called? Uh, Blood Trails. Blood Trails. And and so just tell us what it is. Okay. Well, by our second year, we were getting so many phone calls. Uh, one of my guys was here one day, uh, and I was sitting sitting in a chair over there just taking phone call after phone call, and he was sitting here writing notes, and we were handing them out to different trackers and then making our track list for the next day. And he said, there, there's got to be a way that people could self-interview themselves. And he said, you could do it by an app. And I said, well, yeah. He said, we could just put our questionnaire on, a, on an app and get it out there. And I said, well, yeah, that'd be pretty simple. I said... He said, yeah, we could put that shot chart on there. And I said, wouldn't it be neat if it's 3D, though? He said, yeah. And I said, wouldn't it be neat if other trackers could use it? They could just be nationwide and help all hunters, help all trackers. Yep. And he's like, well, I never think that big. <laughs> <laughs> so it took us a while. It took us a year to find somebody to build it. Yeah. And then we found a group that would build it. And I had... Like I said, I'm a biologist, I'm a mountain boy, I'm a hunter, and a tracker. And I knew how I wanted this thing done. But I was dealing with a couple of yuppies. 
<laughs> they didn't know nothing about it. They didn't know nothing about it. And they were telling me that won't work. And I'm like, yeah, it will. Uh, they they give me a 3D model and you, you, you click where you shot on it and it just turned the deer broadside every time, no matter how you, and like you shot, he said, well, you're hitting the same block. I said, yeah, but arrows and bullets. Go this way. Yeah. And it, it took me two weeks to get them to understand that before they, so it was up until the first weeks of West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania season before it released. Well, in eight short weeks, we got a thousand users, over 300 trackers nationwide and 700 users had almost a hundred tracks come through it, which was pretty good. That's pretty good. So we went with a different developer than after the season and pretty seamless. It's already back up, but we're adding stuff to it. Um, this one's going to be more uh, user-friendly, more outdoor-oriented. When you get on it, you're going to know you're like on an outdoor site. There's going to be banner ads for some big outdoor companies and stuff nice. like that. Uh, there's a hunter section. They just get in there. I'm a hunter, and I need help. And they sell out their interview right there and hit submit. Will it send it to trackers? Yeah. So uh, like, will, a tracker could get on there and be like, all right, and like, like accept the track? Or... Yeah, it'll push notify uh, all the trackers in a radius uh, by text. Mm -hmm. um, we we try, decided to go the text route this way. We did push notifications on this last one. A lot of trackers wouldn't get them because they'd be just to poor service. Right. Where a text message will go through before a SMS, or SMS will go through before a push notification. So you'll get a text that says there's a track, you know, within so many miles of you. Right. And you can get on there. The way we had it initially set up, and going on all developer's suggestion was trackers would bid. Not anymore. You just get on there, you talk to the hunter. If the hunter wants you, they accept you. So, so how do you get signed up as like a tracker? Like if we were wanted to be be able to get those text messages, uh, all you do is uh, get on uh, the Blood Trails uh, Tracking App dot com. Hit I am a tracker. Fill out the interview form. Uh, we ask you just a few simple questions. You know, breed a dog. How many years you've been doing this? How many recoveries do you think you have lifetime? If you do have certificates with the training certificates or testing, I should say. Uh, what areas you cover, what's your fee range, stuff like that. And um, those all come in to Chrissy and I, and we look at them. And we, so yeah. you, you sift them and yeah. prove them or deny them. Yeah, and, and we, I mean, we don't deny very many people. Um, I just tell everybody, send them the same welcome email, welcome on board. And, right. Uh, we're pretty pretty easy to get on as a as a tracker on that app, but... You, there are ratings on there, and if you start out getting three or four bad ones in a row, you might find yourself locked out. Man, yeah. Because uh, is the app? What's the what's the app cost? Um, it was free. Some of the things we're setting up, it's going to have a tracker analytics page where you can use our app to store all your track information, even tracks you take outside of the app. So nice. All your information. And then it'll do your percentages, your totals. You can store pictures in there. And that's something we've we've worked hard on that the first developers wouldn't do. Um, but we're thinking it's probably going to be like fourteen ninety nine a year. Nice. That's, that's good. Yeah. It, will you have, a like the Onyx, will it have an actual tracker? We are trying to get that. We don't have it right now. Because I use the tracker religiously. Yes. Like, yes. Um, our, we have a deal with Garmin and I will say that they are watching this app very closely and I am sure if we get to a certain amount of users and then they're doing good, they'll jump up for it. Yeah. I, I preach on X and I share a lot yeah. of on X, you know, when I get done with my track, I can just send it right to them. They can see everywhere I've walked. Say we didn't find the deer. They, they know where they, they want to get search look, afterwards. Yeah, right. They got an idea where to right. look. Yes. Right. So I get a lot of calls that I like. You know, somebody calls me, say, they shot one, center mass, big rage, broadhead, big expandable. Um, they've been 300 yards. They had good blood for a little ways. There's some corn in the blood and then nothing. I get excited. Oh, yes. 
do you have the same type calls or the same type success or a certain yeah. scenario you like better than others? Well, I, you know, I, we, we hide nothing from the public. We tell them, you know, the, the two biggest words a hunter can say to a tracker is, I think I gut shot a deer. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I gut shot. Okay. Sweet. See, now when West Virginia became legal, and this was the difference between Ohio and West Virginia, because we did track a little bit of Ohio and Kentucky before we started in West Virginia, just to sure. get our feet wet. You know, the hunters over there in Ohio, they know to tell you that. Yeah. Okay. Even if it's not, they know to tell you that. I think I've seasoned all of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, in West Virginia, our first year, they didn't know that. They were just being, I get a boy call me and I shot the biggest buck of my life. I got shot him. Bummed out. I'm, I'm sick. And I'm going to, hey, man, I'll be there. We've got morning. a chance. Well, yeah, I, this is a pretty good chance, you know, in the first year. I'm not throwing numbers out there or anything, but, hey, we, we should probably find Probably us. looking for a dead deer, a yeah. one that's laying down here yeah. close. I'd say, did you did you follow? Oh, I went about 20 yards and didn't find any blood, so I just came out and called you. Perfect. I said, go home. Perfect. Let it die. Yeah, go home. I'll see you in the morning. We'll get it. And there, Well, what if the, it rains? Yeah, what if it rains? I tell them. Rain don't matter. I don't care. I don't care. Rain hey. don't matter. And... And it's now we well, get, you know, there are different elevations here. We make sure you get a lot more snow than we do. And, you know, six inches start concerning me, but less than that. Mm. Well, it just, they go right through it like it's, yeah. like he, Buck, it's just like he's a, a deer whisperer. Like mm. he just takes you that way. And here it is. There it is. And it, I had a guy uh, recently sent one of my one of my guys down on in uh, Nicholas County, West Virginia. They had a snow, shot the deer in the morning, and as he's tracking, the temperature shoots up to 50 degrees. Snow goes perfect. And he's like, I know I killed this deer, but my, it's gone. Washed the blood away. Yeah. yeah. And I told him, I said, well, I'll get, I'll get Chad down to you. Um, one mature out to a one of my trackers from Southern West Virginia, and he said, "It's there's nothing there. There's nothing there." I said, "You just went from having a track for a dog that's maybe an inch wide on those blood drops to where it's diluted out now, and it could be a foot wide." And I said, "It's like it's like going from a country road to a four lane highway now." Mm -hmm. And that hunter thought about that for a second. He said, I, I have to see it in action, but I kind of understand what you're saying. Well, Chad showed up. And it works. 12, 13 minutes later, he had the deer, and the guy called me back and said, wow. Yep. And I said, you should see him after a raid. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Now, I find the opposite during the sun. Like oh. 80 degrees, dry weather, yeah. oak, big oak flats. Yeah, I tell you, yeah. Everybody's like, oh, it's just perfect hunting weather. Yeah, but it's terrible track. Terrible tracking. And uh, everybody asked me, well, what's your, what's bad tracking? And I said, if they're flying red flag fire warnings, bad. you're not going to find very much. Very much. I said, if you've got, uh, you know, chance of light rain. Do. Yeah. Right after the frost burns off. Yeah. Now, do you track a lot at night? All the time. I'd rather track at night. I'm not the biggest night tracker. But it is more effective because of the humidity. I'm sure the humidity helps, but I find less people in the woods. Right. Less people in the woods, and uh, I don't know. I like track at night. It seems like the, uh, my, I'm looking where the light is, so I see blood a little better. Yeah, right. And, you know, my dog's right in my light where daytime, I guess I'm distracted a little more. Nighttime, I'm looking right at him. He stops here, looks here, I look there. Uh, I'm pretty good at nighttime. Yeah. The Terriers are so sight motivated at times that I think nights. Well, we'll find a piece of trash, a white bucket. As soon as he sees that white bucket, straight to it. Yeah. And then we get there, it's a bucket. He turns around and comes back. He thinks it's the belly. Right. I mean, he sees it. Yeah. And uh, and over and over, we'll come to a holla and uh, we jump it. All you got to do is look at the dog. If he stops, throws his head up, you look where he's looking. Because most of the time, he's watching the deer run off. Right. Yeah, right. he'll tell you everything. Well, that's exactly right. One of our last tracks of the year over in Ohio, actually, I had talked to you about. Yep. Uh, the guy had beat the track to death for two days before he called, and we get there, 
and he he showed me his grid search on Onyx, and I'm like, oh, oh cow. <laughs> he said, and, and that's before just the look, dog came, before the dog came, and he said, and that's just mine. He said, I had my buddy in here too. So Jesse took me right down the trail, and he said, oh, she's right on it, she's right on it, and and we get down, and he said, now this is where I lost it. Well, they all went left, and there's a steep hollow to her right. Well, Jesse makes a hard right, and she stops on the edge of that hollow, and I'm looking over there, and then she took off, and she opened up, which she doesn't do unless she sees a running... Jumped it. Floor. Yeah. And he said, there's no way that thing was laying right there. It's been two days. And I said, that was your deer. And then we took it another four or 500 yards and found one more drop of blood, and I don't think he bought it at first, and but then he thought about it a day or so and got back a hold of me and said, thank you, you gave me peace of mind. Yeah, that was it. That was my deer. And, and you're right, they, yeah, they, that head comes up. And they show you. You just, you got to watch the dog. Yeah. So, as we were driving up here, Walter and I were talking, and, and he's 45 tracks less this year than he was last year, which brings me to the next subject um obviously i would say a huge reason behind that's the drones yeah the thermal drones which they're not legal in west virginia no correct and uh, did you play a part in we i mean we didn't play a part in the in wounded game recovery of having a mill legal but i did work with uh one of the senators there a few years ago when the drone issue come up because people were using them down in southern West Virginia on the large strips to locate big bucks. And then they'd make... Live deer before they hunted them. Yes. And um, they actually caught a coal baron out of Kentucky that was flying his helicopter over and was shooting out of the helicopter. Big deer. So <laughs> wow. that it all came together that they just outlawed any aerial... Aerial. Yep. Yep. Um... But yes, I mean, there's been a huge influx with it. I mean, just right. a couple of years ago, you had the the drone deer recovery guy, and you know, it was cool, whatever. And then this year, it was just a huge spike. It seems like you know, they're just popping up everywhere. I mean, well, I was at the gas station in Lower Salem, and there was flyer on the door for mm -hmm. some dude in the drone. I, you know, that's a tricky subject, and and some people uh, uh, that follow us, uh, uh, I. So you're dead set against them. No, I'm not dead set against them. I'm like, you know, a military background. There's nothing wrong with having eyes in the sky, but you better have a SEAL team on the ground. That's how I feel. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and and what I see in that drone business is, but I'm also seeing it in the dog business. So I don't want to, you know, completely slam on the drone guys, but I'm seeing a lot of gamers and hipsters buying drones that don't know a thing about deer well that's exactly what him and i were talking about on the way up here like uh, so i bought a thermal drone mm -hmm. and um i mean it was cool whatever i got rid of it but uh it seems like most of the people with the dogs not all of them come from a hunting background right and they they're a little more knowledgeable a little more serious about it anybody's can go grab this drone and and fly it right and and i think there are some people out there that have good intentions with it. And then there's just some people that it's just a money grab. Right. You know, like my question is, is, you know, if we're tracking a deer with a dog and if it's dead or almost dead, uh, we're going to make a, a game plan for the hunter to be able to, you know, go right. back in and get it or whatever. I see a lot of people complain about some of the drone guys flying the drone, finding the deer, saying, oh, there's your deer, it's still alive. I'll take the money and roll out. Yeah. What do, what do you do? What do you do then? You know what I then mean? Then they go back in, the deer's gone. Right. I mean, now, now and if, what? If, if I was going to take a drone in and fly it, find a deer, looks like he's mortally wounded, he's going to die. Like, I'm either going to stay with that guy and I think and, the, and, and wait and fly again. Drone flyer or the pilot should have to walk with you to the deer to right. prove that you found it. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, there's a lot of, variables there yeah and, and the biggest thing i see i saw an advertisement the other day actually a guy was advertising his services in west virginia oh boy and uh his thing is oh, why wait for a dog we can come right away <laughs> okay well 
Do you know why you wait for a dog? You let them die. Yeah, because most people mess up by tracking too soon. Too soon. Right. And, and flying that drone can be. Th I mean, hey, that's great. Go find it after you know ten minutes. But like you said, what's the game plan? Right. Yeah. What do you do then? You know. What like, do you do then? I mean, I think there's definitely scenarios where uh, the drone would be useful. You yeah. know, like I don't know enough about them to be either way. Right. But just uh, brush brushy fields that are like impossible to get right. through. You know, that you can just put it in the air. You know large areas strip mines stuff like that but i would love to have a drone in the sky above me a lot of times while i'm tracking well, yeah if you could see times i got in real thick brushy fields and i would just like to see what's over that hill but from my knowledge and i don't know a whole lot about it like the the laws of it in ohio but from what i understand there you can't be in the woods while, while the drone while the the air. is in the air correct right i believe that is correct yeah now if you Obviously, I don't think they'd ever make it legal because people would probably take advantage of it. But, I mean, if you could have a guy with a dog on the ground, right. drone in the sky, like, but. That would be a good team. It would be a good team. But, obviously, yeah. people would start hunting them that way and not just tracking them. That right. Way. Uh, Maryland is a state that is legal for drones. Mm -hmm. And th they have an interesting uh, law. I, and I've said that if West Virginia ever looks at legalizing them um they locate the deer a lot but uh, that hunter can't go to that deer for 24 hours yeah that's a good idea so illinois you can bring a drone in and I, I believe this is correct you can have a guy come in if he and find your deer but if he finds that deer you're not dead to with a drone you're not allowed to recover it oh my now i think georgia you can they can run the dogs on the ground drone in the sky at the same time the, the, and the biggest thing I've seen about drones, the biggest thing is it, just being unscrupulous and not truthful in what they can do. Uh, the first day of Kentucky season this year, it was 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a client shoot a deer. Uh, he was on a lease with other guys. Um, they did try to get a call a dog first. And, but they didn't have a long list of people to call. They just knew, hey, hey, this guy knows this guy, call him. They called him. He wasn't available. And they were like, well, we just don't want any dog down in here. So don't, you know, get a drag. And I, I don't throw people under the bus, but I do say, you know, a uh, guy that operates that pretty famous YouTube channel showed up for this guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Six hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. He said the hunter told me he said that he paid that six fifty. He got eighteen minutes of flight time, and he got a speech how dogs are terrible. Yeah, keep them out of the woods. And then after eighteen minutes, he said it ain't it ain't gonna happen today. It ain't gonna happen. I'm not getting good readings. I gotta go. Well, it would be hard to get good readings. Hundred degrees. Got a hundred degrees. That's right, because a deer is 104 degrees right. when it's alive. So yeah, there's no variation. Yeah, so it, it could cool down real quick to that 100 degrees. So, so my thing is, and like him and I were talking about in the last one was, I don't know how, I don't know enough about it. Like, so I bought one and played with it for a little bit, and I was like, yeah, whatever. I'll, right. I'll just keep the dog. And, uh, but I don't know how long that thermal is effective. Like, I don't know how long the deer body, and you, you might know more about it than me, I mean, I've heard some people say eight hours, whatever. I heard 30. Um, I can't imagine that a deer, it, I think it would also depend on the outside temperature, but like. Is it lying in a creek? Exactly. If, yeah. if it's 30 degrees outside and that deer runs and dies in two foot of ice water. Right. Obviously it's going to cool down quicker. Right. So I, I just don't know how long the thermal part of it would be effective. I think you. I think it would be limited. Uh, you're also lim limited by canopy. Oh yeah, like early season. Well, like when I first bought my drone, I was like, "Well, this would be way nicer late December, January when you can actually see stuff." Yeah, and that's why these guys advertise to come right away. Oh, while it's, right while it's warm. While it's warm. It, and so, the, it, as a businessman, now I'm torn on this. I have trackers that are interested in it. 
Right. I have guys that live on the Ohio River, guys that live over on the Easter Panhandle, West Virginia, bordering states that are legal where they track. So I'm like, okay, so, you know, we're we're looking into it. But I don't think I would ever just have drone guys. No. I'm going to have guys that pull up, they have their dog, and they have their drone. And you look at the situation, okay? Okay, oh, I'm in Ohio. I'm on a huge strip. The deer went out in this grass, and, and they that's where they lost sight. Let's fly their drone first. Sure. Okay. Hey, we don't see it. Or, hey, we see it two minutes in the air. There it is. Okay, great. Go get it. Go to the next one. Right. Or we don't see it. Okay, let's put the dog on it. Go track it. Um, I think that's where the future will be with the drones. Mm -hmm. Also, the prices are coming down. So that's where you see people, and I'm, you know, I hate using people's names, but Mr. Yoder with his own uh -huh. drone deer recovery, his business could start coming down because he was relying on selling them $20,000 drones. Mm -hmm. So I know the drone uh, I was looking at like a year ago was almost double the price. Like, yeah. It was like 20 some thousand. You can buy it now for like 12. Right. And, uh. If you watch those Ohio deer pages, there's a lot of that used with salt for well, sale right so now. Everybody jumped on this wave for deer season. Yeah, yeah it's been yeah. five, six, eight, ten thousand dollars, and now you can finance them, right? Right. So people finance them. They're like, well, I can afford the payment for a month or two and make a little bit of money, and then they dump them off eBay or whatever. Right. But I think the future will be the guys that are into it full time as trackers, implementing a trip. Yeah, I think like I told him, I said I think the drone it's a it's a it's a fad. Yes, and it, I don't think it's going to go away necessarily. Right, but I think you're going to get rid of people that aren't serious about it. Like, right, there's going to be a bunch of people do it for a year or two, and then the people that have it, it's going to start equaling out with the dogs. Like, right, and as a businessman, you you know you all had it down to tracks. I had it down to we lost like ten thousand dollars in Ohio. Yeah, sure, we were down. Uh. Oh, don't worry. We figured up that amount, too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, grand. Yeah. One thing I can see where the drones would be good is sometimes I'll come onto a piece of property. Well, anymore, there's always outfitters and there's out-of-town hunters. Right. So the properties are not very big. They mm. broke up. So the deer runs off of the property line quickly. Yeah, property boundaries. Well, you get to the property boundary, they got hunter, hunters paying to be in there. Right. So, and they're only there for a limited amount of days. So a lot of times they won't let me and the dog come in there and track right. until those hunters are out of the woods. And sometimes they don't even want us to go through there because that guy's paid for that land right. for the next few days. So in that case, yeah, if you had a drone available while you was tracking, right, throw the drone up. If it was on the neighbors, you could say, hey, we found it. Here it is. You can show him. Right. It, that might be a good. I mean, I... I I love drones. Like I, I bought my first drone back in like 2012 or 13 when right. GPS drones first come out. Cause I used to love doing videography and stuff. So I'm like, I'm a tech nerd when it comes to that, right. that kind of stuff. But I don't see where there's near the benefit to a drone as the dog. Like right. these guys on there, like, yeah, there's some benefit to it, but the dog can do it no matter what. Right. I tell, I tell people when they ask me, I said, now that, that I want you to think about this. I said, what are the two things a drone guy can tell you? Because there's only two things he can tell you. I see your deer. I don't see your deer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A dog guy can say, your deer went this way. It, it was here. It was, it was here. It was here. It went like this far. far. There's a bed here. And it's still alive or, hey, here it is. Yeah. So have you had any calls to come track a deer? After the drones have been there. Yeah. And that's where I was going with that Kentucky uh, story. Uh, I was actually in Parkersburg at an outdoor show. And I got uh, the call from this gentleman. And he was in Vermont. And I said, Vermont number, and I answered it. My son, he said, hey, I'm so-and-so. You have a dog that can locate a deer five, six days after shot. And I said, well, it probably not going to track. I said, what are you talking about? It'll wind it. And he said, Kentucky. Uh, he said, I just left down there. 
And I said, it's been 100 degrees. There's no way. A track's deteriorating. There's no track. Yeah. And he said, well, I hired, you know, the drone guy. And he came down and gave me my speech and took my money and said, I can't, I, you know, I can't even locate a live deer. He said that it's just not working. So I messaged my chain. And I said, anybody want to make a drive over towards Maysville, Kentucky and go find a deer? Because he, I mean, the hunter told me, he said, I got shot this deer. It's dead. I got you. Just got to find it. Yeah. So I sent one of my young guys down. I were actually one of my apprentices. We hadn't even made him a tracker yet. He had an eight-month-old GSP, one of our dogs. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, take, we'll take the Onyx map that the hunter sent you about what direction it went in when it left him. I said, walk that direction. I said, and just read your dog. And I said, start using the wind in your no in your favor. I said, see what he picks up. So he he did that. Well, dog hit on something. It was a shoulder blade with skin still on it fresh. He's like, oh, he took a picture and sent it to the chain. He said, I might be onto something here. Well, ten minutes later, he sent. The, he had it. He had it. Yep. Um, coyotes had picked that thing clean in five days and had chewed the velvet off the rack because it was a big pretty velvet yeah. duck and of course the hunter was sick about that that's why sure. he, he was one that velvet box but boom but yes we had other tracks uh where guys went in and recovered after drones uh this year in ohio um i tried to you know not i, I don't want to make it a war no i don't, I don't yeah. have anything against anybody yeah but because i want to help everybody and do the best by right. the hunter i mean i think and the, by the deer the people that are you know that actually like love tracking and finding deer like you know they want whatever's the best option for right. it, you know like if, if a drone can do it that's fine but uh yeah i don't know it's uh it seems like the dog guys are not as anti-drone as the Drone guys are anti-dog, yeah. And, uh, and I can on then also, in inside the dog guys, I can give you the sectors that are more anti-drone. Yeah. And then the guys that sure. aren't. Yep. Um, so going back to that dead deer five days later, yeah. if somebody does call you with a several-day-old track, is there a certain dog you'll pick over others to go out? Yeah. Uh, there are. I, okay. Jessie, of course, she's my main one. She's going to go on every every one because That's like buck for me. Yeah. Um, if it's if it's been three days, and I've taken deer five days. Yep, I have two. Um, I'm I'm taking a bird dog with, me. and the reason being is I put him out there on that thirty foot lead, and uh, I may on that track let Chrissy run Jesse or or the terrier try to track and then I'll be coming behind with that bird dog and it'll be tracking but it's gonna be wind wind in that's right yeah and I hey a body location to me is just as as good as that's that, right track because I am a I, I'll tell people I'm a deer recovery guy that's right you I, I track them mm-hmm. and I recover them. and I want to make hunters happy uh, however that is and I can't we catch a lot of flack on some of those national pages well then you aren't a true tracker I mean, I have actually had guys that say, I don't care if I know that deer's dead. If my dog won't track it, I'm done. I've had tracks uh, where yeah. I know the deer is dead. Yeah. The track is tough. Mm-hmm. And I know the terrain. I get on there and I'll use every guy available. And I'll walk the dog in the front, but we'll make like a, a, a V. Mm-hmm. And I'll use every person available and we'll spread out. Yeah. And and we'll go search this area and come back and search this area and over and over and over, you know, gut shot deer, uh, hot track. I know he's dead. I know normally within 600 yards of the shot and, and I'll use every, every asset available when I'm out there. You, you said that I know V had an old, um, hunter here in West Virginia that my, my dad was not a deer hunter. My granddad wasn't. There wasn't any deer when my granddad was growing up, so they they just never deer hunted. And when I 
you know, I, I was the first generation of butlers down Braxton County and you got to start seeing some deer. You know, so I got the deer fever. Well, I, I hunted with other people and other families that had deer hunted. And I had one older guy tell me, and he said, now listen, when you shoot a deer, you stand there, at your, when you're losing sign, your last sign, he said, you know that deer's dead. He said, you can hold your arms like this. Right? That's right. And he said, that deer. That's that area. It may be two miles out, and that V may be huge out there. That's it. Deer's right in there. You know, I, and I caution people about old wives' tales, but that's one that does work a lot. Uh, and I'll, I'll be out there looking at that and doing that, and hunters will be looking at me. I'm, I'm just looking at terrain, and that deer's going to be right in there. So, you know, I've tracked lots of deer in the past 17 years, almost a 1,000 of them now. For me, in our area, I'm sure areas are different. I'm just used to southeastern Ohio whitetails. So if it's in shot in front of the diaphragm, if it's over 300 yards, it's normally not fatal. Right. For behind the diaphragm, I find almost every single one of them dead or alive within 600 yards, 600 mm -hmm. yards or less. Right. Do you find that's pretty relative that's pretty relative here. I think sometimes the distances are a little shorter because of rougher topography. The deer don't go as far. Oh, I definitely like shorter. Yeah. But um, yeah. I tell a lot of people, you know, if if you can track that deer to 600 yards mm -hmm. on its own, no, uh, you're finding blood at 600 yards, no beds, you're not seeing the deer, there's no sign of gut. Probably still alive. It'll be alive when you find it. That's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we, you know, do our yardage averages and stuff and in west virginia it's about a three to five hundred yard gate yep after that you know if i can get i always told everybody if i can get to 600 yards i can tell you what happened to your deer right so you track mostly in west virginia right but you do still track in ohio and in kentucky. kentucky yeah so not all of your hunters combined but like you right how many did you track in west virginia well, this year I, I think we, uh, Chrissy and I only did 60 this year because we took September off mm -hmm. and, and the first couple of weeks of October as we were doing this app launch. Um, plus, we also had the, the litter of pups, which we had trouble with. So time consuming in that. So I let all my young guys do that. So right. I ran about mm, 65, 70 tracks this year. Gotcha. We usually do 90 to 100. Um, and that's, you know, both of us working together, trying to be parents with a, of a young girl. We try to fit it in. So that was my next question. You and her track two dogs together on every track. Almost. Almost. Almost every track we'll run two dogs together. And you run GPS garments on the dogs? Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. And that way I can, we're looking, we can tell where if we split off. So do you run the dogs head to head or do you keep one in front, one in back? I keep one in back, but uh, Massey, the daughter, she's not liking that. She she started to uh, uh, open up when her mama pulls out away from her. So do you find them competing to be ahead? Yeah. Maybe overrunning the track a little bit? I, I seen that when we would run Jesse and her brother. I don't see that with mother-daughter. I see them competing and going right to the deer a lot. I mean, they're they're about they're to reading each other, reading each other, and they're working as a team. Where Jesse always wanted to be her brother. There. Yeah, of course, these yog terriers are tough. They they hate their siblings. Yeah, Jack Russell the same way. Uh, mothers will tolerate their pups, but they hate their siblings. Yep. And I've had a couple rough fights over. <laughs> I've had some like, tough fights with my jacks. It's yep. tough. So, so the another question that I want to ask. So, him and I were talking about broadheads uh, on our last one and you know, what we get the most calls about. And then there were some comments on our YouTube of our podcast, some other trackers. I don't remember. I don't even know if I know who they are, but apparently they're trackers who said that they thought it was interesting. What we said it was opposite of their experience. So what do you find you get the most calls about that are unsuccessful tracks on a broadhead, like a fixed blade mechanical, et cetera? That's a great question. Uh, one of the 
most unsuccessful tracks seems to be small diameter fixed blade broadheads that shoot like a 22 bullet. Sport. You read my mind. There you go. So we always say uh, Muzzy. Muzzy. Three blade, 100 G5 Mon. Yep. G5 Mon Tech. Whackums. Yep. Whackums are one of the. Slick trick. Yeah. Yeah. Small diameter. I mean, hey, shoot that big. Big expand. Five green expandable or even a big double bevel. Just anything big. big. Yep. And, uh, but I tell them, you know, they're, you know, that, that big fixed blade might help you out on the shoulder. Stay away from the shoulders. But stay away from them. So, like we say, you know, your kill shot kill zones a third of the size of eight inch pipe blade. If you're shooting, you know, in front of the diaphragm versus behind the diaphragm. Now, people look at you crazy when you say, use a big broadhead, shoot them center of the body, shoot them in the guts, it's going to kill them every time. But if you shoot them in the center of the body, the center of the body doesn't duck either. Like right. if the, when they duck the front and the shoulders drop, the center of the body stays the same. So you're not going to shoot over them either. There's an area that I tell people that the, those lungs come up those back lobes of those lungs and if that's where you aim for you're going to be off the shoulder if somehow you make a mistake and shoot a little forward you, you're not going to be way forward in the shoulder you're going to be a little forward and hit in the pocket mm -hmm. and if for some reason you flinch and shoot back it's tell you call got him. him call him at him <laughs> yeah most of the people that um well most of the time for us, my wife, me, my daughter, we shoot center mass. I tell them to hold halfway between the front shoulder, halfway be between the hind quarter, lower one third, just below center line. And we never get to track our deer with our dogs. Knock on wood. It's a great yeah. day. I, and yeah. I always try to get the dogs for practice. You know, I always have right. beginner dogs, but my wife and my daughter, they want to track them too. Right. So uh, they want to track them themselves, not with the dog. Right. And uh, we rarely ever have any trouble shooting with the big broadhead. Most yep. time, just the liver diaphragm area, it takes them out. They don't go very high. 80, 90 yards max, and they're done. Right. Now, I do see some variations in the broadhead models. I mean, the 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 big two-blade expandables are good. I, I mean, I don't like the expandables that only have the needle point. I don't like anything that folds from the front. Yeah. I like a rear deploying. Rear something deploying. Something like a raid, sever. Yeah. The new Raven. You get the big entrance pull. That yeah. Way. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, it, you get that argument all the time, you know. Hunters are out there saying, ah, oh, you get to shoot fixed blade. No, you got to shoot expandable. Well, I, I don't mind tracking expandable, you know. Um, so the broadside. Yeah. I don't like the broadside shot. Especially from a ground blind. If it's eye level, a lot of times if you don't hit it going in, you don't get it coming out. Right. I like the quartered shot. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of people like the quartered away shot, but it's going up into the lungs. Mm -hmm. I don't even try to aim for the lungs no more. No. I track more live wounded deer shot in the lungs. Yeah. And more dead fatal deer shot behind the diaphragm. Right. I just aim center mass. Yeah. I don't, I don't People even, don't believe that a deer can be shot in the lungs and yeah, live. And live. They don't. I mean, we found them, the hunters got them, and, and one lung will be with an arrow in it. Back black, deflated with a with an arrow in it. Yeah. You know, like they can live on one lung. Yeah. And and they can do well on one lung. Yep. I mean. Uh, so I recommend the quarter two shot for myself. That's my favorite shot. I like an exit anywhere around the hind quarter. Oh, yeah. I, if I get an exit around the hind quarter, dead deer 99 percent of the time you'll never call me right but one he won't go very far that's right you back out and leave and just 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 leave and come back four or five hours later he'll be right there i i shot one here up behind the house this year and everybody makes fun of the old 6.5 creed more i love mine i and i love mine too i i would have never used one I would have never owned one, but I won this one uh -huh. at a National Wild Turkey Federation banquet. And I was like, well, it was a Kimber. I mean, nice. I was like, nice rifle. Because I, I primitive hunt, muzzleloader hunt more than anything. I said, yeah, if we don't want it, I'll hunt with it. And that thing just knocks them crazy. Well, this year I had one quartered to me. And I watched him and watched him. It was cold. 
And finally, he gave me just the right opening to get that exit at that ham. Far ham. And I shot it. And usually, they just crumple with that 6.5. Well, this buck, he ran right up to my blind. Just out of my sight, it went quiet. It was like, he went down. But I was going to be, you know, careful. So I sat there a little longer and then I started shivering and I radioed down to Chrissy. So I'm coming to the house, going to get warmed up. I'm, we'll go back up and get him. I unzipped that blind. And I heard him get up and take off. Oh, man. I said, oh. So I came on down to the house and she said, well, what do you think? And I said, eh, this wait till about three this afternoon. Take Jess up there. We might need her. Well, I got up there. That deer never bled a drop. And she said, are you sure you even hit this deer? Well, there was like six hairs at the impact site. And then where he laid down over by my blind, found a little patch of hair with skin on it. No blood. But Jesse was doing that pull. Let's go. I said, he's right here somewhere. Well, we went down in the heck with a thick patch. It was only about 120, 130 yard track. But, I mean, if you wouldn't have taken a dog, you'd have spent two hours oh, near yeah. that zigzagging looking for him because there was no Step. blood no blood but like you said it was a very dead deer and he was dead quick he dead. was dead yep. after that jump yep um and that's you know something i see find a lot too you know how many times do you get that dead deer real quick after a jump? a lot of times i think especially with a gut shot liver yeah. shot so when they're laying there um you know, the blood is not circulating through their organs or through their their veins. Right. So when you jump them, that blood instantly gets circulated back through their heart, and that bad poisoned blood goes back to the heart and kills them instantly. Yeah, it just, just shocks their system. Over and over. I, one will be laying there all night, and I'll jump it. And we didn't necessarily see it and get up, but when I find his limp, it's warm, it's limp, it just died. You know that it just Jump, died. Just ran down here. And That's happened several times. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. The, um, so you train your dogs, you train some pups and sell them? Yes. It's, so at what age do you prefer to sell them? Because we were talking about this the other day, too. I mean, as a dog guy, I prefer to sell them at six months old, get them out of here. Yeah. But some of them take a little longer to mature, and you sell them at a year. I've got one out here right now that's 18 months old, and he, but he started to show me a little bit of everything. He, you know, he's a German short hair pointer. I'm wanting him to be a little bit of everything for somebody. I don't. Right. He's just not just a tracking dog. I mean, he's pointing birds or rabbits. He's finding shed, sees it tracking sure. deer, and uh, had him do a water retrieve on a duck the other day, and he jumped right in when got it. So nice. He's he's about ready. Yep. He's. About so if you sell a pup at six months, he's just obviously just just barely been trained, right? right? Like like you said, off the liver or blood or whatever, a little bit. Right. And then do you give whoever buys it as buying as a tracking dog, like a guide, like a a way to finish the dog out? Yeah, I do. And the what... concerning part to me is 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 you could track you could train a dog and get rid of him at two years old, but if the handler doesn't know what he's doing and doesn't continue to do anything, they can ruin it. I just had that discussion because we also train other people's dogs here too. Um, and the training's only as good as the work as you put in, as you put into the dog after you pick it up. Yeah, continued education. Yeah. You can't. Yeah, you can't stick it in a kennel. Right. Uh, as soon as you come pick it up, and then expect it to track next fall. Yep. And you can't take a tracking dog and throw it out there and expect it to run straight to the deer every time like no. a, do a beagle dog on a rabbit. No. no it's, it's, it's it's as much the handler as it is the dog. Yeah, it's absolutely. Now, a, a dead deer that's laying there 100 yards, you know, it, that's simple. Right. It's the ones that's four and 500 yards, no blood, down in the thick brush when, you know, it just take you days to look through the brush. Right. Those are the ones that it takes more than just the dog. So I assume you, you won't just sell your dogs to just anybody, right? Like No. I mean, people want to come to you because you're, you've you been doing it for years, and you know, they know you as a tracker, and they want to get into it. And then I assume if they buy a dog off of you, you're happy to continue to help them yeah. with it, right? Yeah. Oh, we're, we're there the whole way, and every dog comes with a contract. Yep. Uh, we want to be the first option to have the dog back. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I tell people is, it, you know, if that if that happens... I'm going to interview you. 
And if you haven't done anything with that dog, then you're handing me a project back. More than likely, I won't buy it back. No. You're, no, you're well, going to tell me. Yeah, yeah. you're going to bring it back. I, <laughs> and I'll have to put more work in do it again. That's right. Some people don't understand that, but I just had that happen with a German short hair pointer pup. The the people took her, and I interviewed them, and I said, now listen, now and the terriers, if I'm not easy with you on the interview, I don't sell you a terrier. Yes. A terrier is like handing somebody a loaded gun. Yeah. The, the pointers, they're a little different. I mean, they're still tuned. I mean, I, we don't have these fuzzy mama dog pointers like you see on a lot of these Facebook pages. I mean, uh, yeah, my... My German wire hairs, if if a dog treats them wrong, they're gonna kill that dog. Right. Sure. I mean, they need just my Jack Russells. Yeah, and, and the yogs are just they like, fight to the death. Yeah, and the, the yogs are just they're just prey to killers. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but I tell these I interviewed this couple and they said, oh yeah, we want to get into tracking, we want to do this with this dog and everything. I said, okay, well, what kind of job you got? He said, I work a pipe wrench. I said, well, I, I used to do that. You work in seven days a week, aren't you? Yeah. So when you go run this dog? Well, she'll run it. Well, what she do? Well, she's a nurse. <laughs> I said, okay, okay. Well, I said, I'll sell you this. Now, remember, your contract, you call me first if you're going to give it up. Okay. He said, okay. Well, well, about three weeks went by, and he calls me, and he says, I can get this dog to house train. I said, okay, well, what, what, what's your ritual or schedule what are you doing with this What's the process yeah and he said well we're ne- neither of us are never here and we're keeping her locked in a laundry room and i said well uh, of course she's not that yeah. house trade yeah. so then and you know another four months goes by he calls me back and says i i just need to bring her to you he said i can't get her to do anything i said the question is are have you done anything with her? right and he said well no i said she's more than welcome to come by yeah so I took her back yeah but I've ended up with four terriers back over the years here, the last four, you know, four years since we really gotten into them. Um, none of that's a, a fault of their own. It's always the buyer. Sure. Right? And uh, none of them are, you know, mean towards people. Yeah. We may have had bites and situations. This high strung. High strung. But they're not mean. They're just uh, people don't know how to handle them. Yeah. You know? My jacks are the same way. If you got to be a dog person, yeah. The, his his Jack Russell's twenty pounds, and my German Shepherd's a hundred and ten pounds. And he tried to kill the German Shepherd. Yeah. Well, oh yeah. We we can't run them. They can't like we'll track together, but we can't let them close to each other. Because right. Because his dog thinks it's a hundred pounds too. <laughs> right. Exactly. So many people see my Jack and they want one. Yeah. And, and I know, just like you said, it's a loaded the, gun. Not and, most people. and my Jack is the way he is because he's with me. Right. He's not going to be that way with you unless you do the same with that I do. I take him every day, get him up early, keep him up late. He, he goes with you everywhere to work. Everywhere. Every day. I take him yeah. every day. Right. So many people say, I want one of those dogs, and I always recommend a dachshund. Yeah. I now, I have dachshunds, and I recommend a dachshund because they're great family dogs. I mean, yeah. if it doesn't work out as a tracking dog, it'll make a great right. family dog. Right. And my dachshunds are really good, but uh, yeah, I don't recommend the jacks. So how many dogs and trackers do you have under you now? We have uh, 45 trackers in 10 different states. 45 trackers. In t- so I guess I don't know the what's the benefit to some of these people being under you in these other states. That, that That's a good question. Okay. The, the way this business model started was in West Virginia, and I kind of explained that to you. We, yep. we had to have an outfitting license. And that first year, we were the only ones with one. So I hired all the other trackers in the state that were in good, and they worked under my license. They were able to charge, and and um, but then we started getting calls, you know, get calls from guys up in Maryland, and we start talking to them and tell them how we do things, and they were like, "Well, what's the benefit?" Well, I didn't have anything at that time, so of course they didn't want to come on, you know. They're like, "Well, I'll just do my own thing," but as we grew. Um, and when I say grew our social media outreach, yep. Uh, companies started noticing this, and we didn't really go fishing for companies. We had a couple come to us, and that got my brain rolling as a business manager. Yeah, and okay, how do we do? You know, we because we want to do this full time. I said I'm not relying anymore 
on a job. Yeah. After being laid off. Sure. To, you know, I'm going to create my own business and we're going to do it as a family and we're not going to rely on anybody else anymore. Yeah. So, uh, started talking with these companies and of course our biggest, biggest company to date to work with has been Garmin. And uh, Garmin gives our trackers approval at a 35% discount on any item. Okay, well, you come on board on with us and track, and you might pay. We, we, we ask our trackers to pay a $25 per track fee. And we do earmark that fee. We don't put that in our pocket. We earmark that fee, and we buy advertising. We, we book shows. We do stuff with that money to help the trackers. Yep. At the same time, they decide they want a new Alpha 300 and a TT25 collar that's 1200 bucks. They're going to get almost 400 bucks off. With yeah, their, nice. Okay. And we have that same deal with other companies, yeah. too. So we have other, uh, you know, um, we, we uh, trying to think of one off the top of my head, TNC crates out of Minnesota. They build custom-made dog crates. If you want one custom-made for any vehicle, they'll make it. Yep. And they give our guys a fifteen percent discount. So I mean, it, it's just like a it's like a network. Yeah. Right? So these guys can jump on with you. The ones in West Virginia don't have to pay all the extra fees and outfit or stuff that right. West Virginia requires. Right. They're not having to give up a bunch of their tracking money. Right. And they they gain all the benefits from the discounts and 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 then the everybody else be able to find somebody to track their deer. I have had guys that tracked before that said they got six to 15 calls a year and now their personal call volume has since they joined us has picked up let alone what we hand them right because we get calls from all over sure and you can't handle them all so no uh, that makes sense um doing you that called me many times yeah 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 i mean and i appreciate it yeah we can't handle them all and, and I tell everybody from West Virginia, to call you. Yeah. Well, we too. appreciate I'm like, it too. I don't do them over there. I don't so even uh, try. Call Sean. Call Phil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it makes sense with your app, too. You know, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I mean, and, and that's going to even spread it more. I mean, yeah. right now, when I refer somebody, I, I'll refer to somebody like you. I'll refer somebody uh, like Toby Burdett. Yep. Yep. I mean, people I know that are going to go find Duke. Reputable, Reputable. Yeah. 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 Because when I say call this guy, I'm putting your my name yep. on it. Sure. Um, with the app, I try, you know, the, there's a disclaimer right there. These are private trackers. Uh, just because they're on this app does not mean they're, they're affiliated with, with you. Yeah. When somebody tells me that you, you send them, I always try harder. <laughs> I want to make sure that, uh, you know, that you get a what? good word back. And same way this year, a guy called me that a drone had come out and looked for his deer. Oh, yeah. And before I left the house, I told my wife, I said, this is the first one I've tried to find this year after a drone's been there. I'm going to find it. Go find it. And I found it. Well, there you go. Yep. Um, it was alive. And it was 24 hours after the drone had been there. And it was within 600 yards of where they shot it. So there was several things they should have been. And it was on top of a hill. And didn't, yeah. he, didn't he fly it? Burn up all, like, four batteries or something? Batteries, yes. They only found two deer and the cows. That's all they found the whole time. Yeah. I will say, the one thing about the thermal drone was the second I put it on the ground, set it up, put it in the air, it took me less than a minute to find deer in the woods. That's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, the the thermal was definitely works. Well, I'm sure sure you'll see stuff along that route. Uh, I don't think... um, I don't think Ohio is going to, like, some people are worried that, like the drones, saying that, you know, Ohio is going to outlaw them or whatever. But everything that I have found, Ohio has no intentions of getting rid of them. Right. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know how you regulate them more. Like, there's no way to regulate, all right, this guy is legit hunter. Like, mm-hmm. he can have a drone. And this guy. Right. Is, it, it's hard. I mean, it, but I, it would be hard. Yeah, very hard. It would be hard. I, I think... I don't know. As bad as it sounds. Well, it's kind of like the trackers in Ohio. Okay, it, it, I, you know, there's no licensing, right? Uh, nothing. I mean, I, the 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 deer trackers page over there try to weed out. Yeah. But and they do pretty good with it. Like yeah, but if the, you're a reputable tracker, you're going to get calls. Yeah. Sure. Yep. 
I mean, that's the bottom. I've walked through the woods with over 2,000 different people in the past 17 years. My phone number is everywhere. Well, yeah, I mean, he was never even on the list. This is the first until... year I've ever done social media. Yeah. <laughs> like, I got him on the list a couple of years ago. That was the first time. And, I mean, it didn't right. make much difference with him because he's just done it for so long with so many people. And the area I tracked in um, until this recently, there just wasn't no one. Right. I mean, there's just nobody in Southeast. There's still not that many. No. Especially other, around Blocking County and yeah. area, that area. There's just not many people. I mean, there's some other areas of Ohio where there, yeah, there's... And then good. I'm listed on that list as West Virginia. I don't even do West Virginia. Right. And half the counties that I track are not listed on that list. Right. So it's kind of confusing for a lot of people. So, well, that was, it was partially my fault because I live in West Virginia, but like I'm right on the border of Ohio. Right. So uh, like I don't track in West Virginia. We do Ohio, but since my... I live in West Virginia. They put that there, and they just assumed since he's my uncle, he lives there too. But right, we not. I'll tell you this is a quick, interesting story. Um, several years ago, it's probably been eight or nine, maybe ten years ago. My brother was hunting in Ohio, and he got shot a deer, and he called me, and I said, "Well, first of all, don't chase it." That's right. And I said, Ohio is legal. You need to find your dog guy. So he asked one of the guys there he's hunting with, and uh, they called you. Really? Yeah. And you recovered that deer for it. Really? Yeah. Wow. So he came here, and he was telling me, oh, it's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I said, it is a pretty cool thing when you see it. And he said, oh, he had a Jack Russell, and it just like to it. And uh, so I was like, huh. You know, I think it was yeah, that. Yeah, that's I'd cool. Heard it cool. Yeah. And and so that was one of the things that as we pushed it here, it I've yeah. always remembered that, you know. That's yeah, really cool. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I think uh I think we're gonna wrap this up. We got a two hour drive back home, yeah. but we really appreciate you letting us come out here and what? do this with you. I mean it's been, been a been... pleasure talking to you and finally getting to put a face yeah, with yeah. The voice. We talked a good bit over the past couple of years, and finally, finally got to meet you here. So well, we appreciate you coming over. Yep. And the next time you're in Parkersburg, give us a shout. And we'll do. We'll, we'll do another one, or we'll go to dinner or something. So. There you yeah. go. There you and go. At the very least, we want to do this again next year at the end of season. Yeah, sounds good. Absolutely. Anytime you want to do it, let us know. All right. Well, thanks, guys, for watching. Uh, have a great, great evening. Boop, boop.